Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Adam Rutherford. He is lecturer in biology and society at the University College London's Department of Genes, Evolution and Environment. His interests are in evolution, genetics and developmental biology, and the history of biology, and today we're going to focus on his great book, Control, the Dark History and Troubling Present, of eugenics. So, Dr. Rutherford, welcome to the show. It's a huge pleasure to everyone. Thank you, Ricardo. It's a pleasure to be here. So, let, let me start with this question, because I guess that sometimes people do not agree even on the definitions of things. So, uh, how do you define eugenics, exactly? <laughs> Well, what, what, in all of my work, I actually try to avoid definitions um, because I find that, that actually they tend to constrict discourse on that subject. Um, and and that, that, that filters into all of my work and also all of my, my sort of social and political beliefs as, as well, that the tighter we try to say what a thing is, the, the less we are capable of understanding what a thing does. Anyway, that's a sort of my background to what that what that definition might be. The, the classical definition, which comes from um, people like Francis Galton, who was the 19th century uh, scientist, polymath thinker, mm. who came up with the term, was that this is the mechanism by which we can change the structure of um, of societies and populations. Um, uh, by addressing both social and biological facets of, of reproduction. Mm. So that, that's a sort of modern in, uh, a modernization of, of one of the many versions that he gave over his, his lifetime of what, of what he was trying to define what eugenics actually is. But it, I think effectively it is attempting to impose social control over biological reproduction with the intention of changing the structure of society. And there's, there's a lot of important caveats within that, one of which is that, and this becomes a semantic argument, but it's one that I'm, I'm happy to have, it, this tends to be in a top-down manner. So, the, so, so from societal control, so government control, uh, onto the populace, rather than possibly something we'll talk about later, which is autonomy from individuals. But yeah, that's, that's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And uh, how old is this ideology? I mean, does it come from initially from the 19th century or is it older than that? It becomes crystallized in the 19th century with Francis Galton and the invention of this word. And that comes in the, in, in the wake of Darwin's theory of natural selection, of evolution by natural selection. So there's this, this huge sort of boost in this ideological mode of thinking that happens at this time um, because of the new evolutionary theories that are, that are uh, part of the public discourse at that time. But eugenics, more than anything, is a way of thinking. So it, it is a, a, a mode of thinking about changing society or maintaining society in a particular way in the face of change. Um, and that is as old as culture. So that, that in, in the Western canon, it is something that Plato talks about explicitly in Republic, in books five and six of, of Republic, where he talks about marriage festivals that are required by the state in order to maintain not only the level of the population, so the, num the number of the population, but also the natural stratifications of the population. So he suggests that you can categorize men and women as gold standard or silver or bronze, and that gold men should marry gold women, and by marry, we mean procreate, have sex with, um, and bronze women should mate with bronze men. And with that, their offspring will be in those categories and the structure of society will be maintained. So that's his version of, of a sort of utopian society where the state, philosopher kings, are imposing um, restrictions and guidelines on who gets to have sex with who um, in order that societal structures are, are maintained or, or improved. So that's what, third century BC. I, I think we see pretty much a continuous mode of thinking like that from then 
till now. And I think we see it in pretty much every culture that, that we've looked at, that there, there are different modes of doing this, but in the pre-molecular age and the pre-evolutionary age, so I mean the 19th and 20th century, um, mostly it's by who gets to marry, so, so determining who gets to marry, um, and also via uh, infanticide, so the killing of, of, of babies. Now we see that we see that described in various classical civilizations. Uh, we see it described in Sparta. We don't really know whether it happened or not, but it's a sort of popular idea, mostly popularized by the stupid ass film 300 from a few years ago. Um, but it's only Plutarch who describes that, and that's several centuries after after the Spartans have fallen. Um, but we do see Seneca describing it explicitly: the drowning of or the killing of babies who are deformed. And, and it is for the good of society. We see it in cultures all around the world. It, it, pr pretty much every, every culture has employed some form of infanticide. And that, I think, is a reflection of the eugenic state of mind. Mm -hmm. And when trying to understand eugenics, do you think it's important for us to distinguish between what we, can, what we might call positive eugenics and negative eugenics, that is, for example, when it comes to the positive aspect of it, enhancement of good traits and the negative aspect, elimination of bad traits. Do you think that that distinction is important here or not? I think it's, it's I, I like the way you did the air quotes there. The, the, yeah, the, I mean, good traits, bad traits, we'll get into that. But, but that, that's kind of exactly the point, though, isn't it? Because yeah. the idea of eugenics when it's... Um, when it becomes formalized in the 19th century is that this is a positive thing. This is, this is for the improvement of a people, British people in this, in the case of Francis Galton. Um, and the word itself, he comes up with the word, it's an invention by him. And it's a conflation of you, EU meaning good in Greek and genics meaning sort of born or Genesis or so it, it, it means well born or um, good genes is a sort of modern interpretation of, the, of that. So its inception is that this is for improvement. It's about identifying high quality or desirable characteristics in people and enhancing them and increasing the frequency of those traits. But the thing is that you, you have to, in order for that to be a, a valid proposition, you have to immediately start judging people on those traits. And you, which means ranking people. And it also means that um, determining who gets to make those choices about what is desirable and what is not. So the opposite of, of eugenics, which is sometimes called dysgenics, so it's a tendency for, for biology to, for, for, to, to sort of degenerate. Um, it just, they, those two things go hand in hand, right? So as soon as you start saying, well, this is a trait we find attractive, uh, which means that people who have this trait are more valuable than people who do not have this trait. So you've already created a sort of hierarchical taxonomic structure. Um, so the, it, it's, it's almost impossible for those two things not to occur simultaneously. And in the discussions about eugenics that we have in the UK in the 19th century and never enacted in legally at least, but in the countries where you, where, where you do see eugenics policy enacted through enforced sterilization, the conversation immediately goes from saying, we want to enhance these particular characteristics to, well, who are the people who don't have them? And what you see every single time is it, the, the order in which people become marginalized through that process is racialized groups. Then it's um, uh, uh, people with disabilities, people with overt physical di disabilities, then it's people with subtler disabilities and sort of bucket categories like feeble mindedness, so pe people with mental health issues. And then it becomes um, alcoholics or people with epilepsy. And then it becomes women with menstrual troubles. And then it becomes, and, you know, and uh, it's always the Jews at the bottom of the pile. Um, so that, that, that question is really fundamental to our understanding historically of the, 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 what eugenics is, which is a mode of thinking, which is ultimately an expression of hegemonic power. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is who gets to make the decision of what is desirable and what is not. And that changes through time. So for you know, a, 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 an example might be that 
100 years ago, um, uh, a condition like achondroplasia, so that's classical dwarfism, short stature dwarfism, might be considered so abhorrent to normal society that those people would be subject to eugenic negative sterilization or, or, or negative selection. We don't want those people in our society. Today, that is not the case. And so we, we have progressed and, and recognized that people with achondroplasia are pretty normal people who contribute to society um, as much as, as anyone. So eugenics is, a, is always a political ideological stance, which is a reflection of, of power. Mm -hmm. And just to be clear, from the point of view of evolutionary biology and genetics, does it make sense to talk about good and bad traits? I mean, is that really a thing or is that just ideological? I think... It's, I think it's an interesting question. Um, let, let's think about how to pick that apart, because in, in straightforward natural selection terms, so classical evolutionary theory, there, there, there are obviously some characteristics which if, they are, which if they result in lack of fertility or, or death, then those are versions of genes which will be rapidly acted on by, by natural selection. If you can't procreate, then you are incapable of, of fulfilling the biological imperative of procreation. Um, in artificial selection, which we have been doing for 10,000 years via the mechanism of farming, we, 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 we target specific traits, not genes, but traits that are encoded by genes and enhance them in order to have you know, milk, um, cows with massive udders that produce a lot of milk or sheep that are very woolly or, 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 or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but they also come hand in hand with negative traits as well. It's that the more we breed an organism to have one particular trait, what we find due to the complexities of, of genetics is that they also come, that they, they also develop different problems. So mastitis in udders and cows is, is one issue there. Or um, breeding sheep which have muscly back legs, which are very juicy and tasty also results in re reduced fertility in, in, in females. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing what I always do and what scientists always do, which is you ask a straightforward question and I go, ah, it's really complicated. <laughs> <laughs> now, when, when it comes to humans, um, the, again, there, there's value judgment uh, some, somewhere in the spectrum of how we analyze how to answer your question. So, again, if uh, genes that result in fatality uh, I, I think we can reasonably say that we would like them to to be eliminated from our population. Um, uh, genes that cause infant death, so specific diseases such as Tay-Sachs disease, um, that, that is uh, one mutation in one gene that I think it's uncontroversial to suggest that if we eliminated that gene from the global population, than the sum total of human happiness and, and um, um, would be would would increase, but then you say things like, well, what about cystic fibrosis, which is a condition that occurs um, as a result of a single mutation in a single gene, and nowadays it does have a restriction on quality of life and does have have a, 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 a an effect on reducing lifespan, but people with cystic fibrosis born today will live into their sixth. Or, or seventh decade, and their lives will possibly be not as easy as someone who doesn't have that. But there is a genetic disorder which historically might have been targeted for eugenic sterilization because of the, the, the suffering it causes in individuals, but today less so. So where do we put uh, a, a genetic mutation such as CFTR Delta 508 on that scale? Do we say that is desirable or undesirable or neutral or achondroplasia, like I just mentioned? And, and those are discussions that I think are the ones that we need to have um, because what they reflect is value, is human value. Does Down syndrome, trisomy 21, does, does, does that, which, which, which it, um, uh, does, does that produce, does that result in human beings who we consider to have value to society or not? Those are real decisions that society is having to make at, at this point because technology has reached the point where we can effectively choose to 
eradicate Down syndrome from a population. Mm -hmm. And please correct me if I'm wrong, but even from the point of view of evolutionary biology, of course, there are probably a few cases like the ones you mentioned, which are more straightforward and we think of them as negative. But isn't it uh, at least tendentially better for us to have a more diverse genetic pool? In, in the case we are exposed to novel environmental conditions, evolutionary pressures and all that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the most obvious example that, to support that would be in resistance to, to disease, to, to, to pathogens. Uh, a, a, um, the more outbred you are, the more genetic diversity you have in a, in a genome and in a population, the more likely there is resistance to, um, to pathogenic attack. Um, so yeah, that that, that is, is definitely the case. We don't want a monoculture, a genetic monoculture, which is what we have in farming. And what, it's a, it's a, you, you raise a really interesting point, which is that farming has always been used as a sort of defense of the principles of eugenics. We do farm. And if you can breed a sheep to be like this, then why can't we do the same for humans and, and, and therefore enhance a particular trait that we, we find interesting? And, and the sort of the superficial reference is fine. What I just said is 100% true. But then you have to recognize what, what's the, the, the problem that you sort of allude to in your question, which is that farming is actually a really brutal process, a really, you know, dispassionate, dispassionately brutal process where you breed in specific traits that you want that are desirable for commercial reasons. And that results in... Um, uh, in unforeseen consequences because genetics is complex through things like pleiotropy and as a result you have to rebreed those animals and you have to endure the fact that many animals will be born diseased or um, need, need to be culled or winnowed from from the population and that's the process of agriculture and we accept that as normal but you know you suggest the same thing for a human population so we end up with a, a genetic, a low genetic diversity and a monoculture in a human population because we've enhanced specific characteristics through eugenic sensibilities. And then you, you end up with, oh, well, now we need to cull these people because they, as a result of that inter intervention, they have all sorts of problems of sterility or disease or, or whatever. So the farming analogy never really works for me. It superficially makes sense until you understand what farming actually is. Mm -hmm. So um, let me ask you this. When it comes to certain medical interventions, like, for example, ge the genetic screening of fertilized eggs and embryos and all of that, fetuses, um, do you think that uh, or would you classify those medical interventions when it is about eliminating, for example, e fertilized eggs that have uh, genes that predispose to certain health conditions or uh, fetuses, like, for example, doing uh, terminating pregnancies and all of that. Do, would you classify that as eugenics? Or... Um, well, I mean, this, this relates to our first question, the first bit of the discussion, which is really a semantic argument about definitions. Mm -hmm. And I tend not to mm -hmm. because... Um, I think that the most useful functional definition of eugenics is that it comes from the state or it comes from the powerful and is imposed upon people. Those reproductive interventions um, that, that you're referring to are, are basically autonomy for parents mm -hmm. to alleviate suffering in their potential offspring and, and indeed their, their lives. Um, I think they would have been a great interest to the eugenicists of, of the past. Um, but I think that it, I find it useful to make a distinction between the sort of state imposed and, and personal choice versions of control over reproductive health. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell us now a little bit about how widespread was the ideology of, eugenic, of eugenics applied politically? in the particularly in the first half of the 20th century because I, I think that many people are not really aware of how widespread it was across particularly the western world right yeah it's a thing that 
continuously amazes me that this idea that we find so toxic today is, uh, you know, is, is, is re re reviled as being a thing that we would never consider today. A hundred years ago, it wasn't universally supported, but it was so culturally normalized um, that, um, well, there's, there's some great examples. There's, there's, so there's eugenics themes in, in some of our greatest literature. So the great Gatsby has a big sort of eugenics theme running through it. It's very explicitly and there are interesting reasons why you could buy eugenic shampoo and eugenic Valentine's cards and, um, uh, and, and, and there are songs written about eugenics in the 1920s and 1930s in, oh in, in America. I know, there is, it's astonishing. And, and it's also across the political spectrum as well. So I think people tend to associate um, the ideas of eugenics, particularly if they've heard of it at all, it tends to be most closely associated with the, the atrocities of the Second World War and the Nazis, and therefore has this extreme right-wing, extreme fascism association. Actually, uh, it, it was supported on the political left and the political right with equal gusto, particularly in the UK. Um, the development of, of eugenics is supported on the political right by people like Churchill and Arthur Balfour, so two prime ministers, um, but also by the founders of socialism in, um, in, in the UK, people like Sidney and Beatrice Webb from the Fabian Society, cultural figures like um, uh, H.G. Wells and Julian Huxley, and I, so, you know, you could just list a bunch of people and just go, wow, you know, everyone was basically in support of it. Not everyone. The, the resistance comes from unusual quarters. And um, the church, the Christian church broadly in the UK was in support of, of eugenics, uh, as much as it has a sort of central philosophy on anything. Um, but a lot of the campaigning against eugenics at this time came from one particular Catholic apologist called G.K. Chesterton, who's a very famous writer and um, uh, comic writer. And, and he recognized something which I think is really important for this conversation, which is that all of those categories of the people who get eugenically selected against, you know, the, the people with feeble mindedness or, um, or the, the criminal classes, um, because we know that those uh, that the disease and particular behavior most commonly associate with with lower socio socio socioeconomic status mm -hmm. what chesterton correctly identified that these sort of pseudo vague categories were not really what was being selected against is that but that eugenics was selection against the poor and that, that troubled his Catholic sensibilities and the idea that Christianity is a bottom-up religion that empowers the poor, I mean, in principle, um, because obviously it's not in, in reality. Um, but that's, that idea that the powerful were imposing their will upon not medical categories, but on poor people, was 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 why he described eugenics as as an evil, uh, and and his influence in the public debate in the UK was 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 not insignificant because he was part of the lobby, which prevented the introduction of compulsory sterilisation into our legislation, um, and we came you know within a whisker of having that on our books. Winston Churchill was the architect of a lot of those those sort of um, uh, those those legal statutes, the Mental Deficiencies Act, 1912, 1913, is the one where we don't have enforced sterilization. So in the UK, we invent this idea, we develop it culturally and scientifically, we export it around the world, including to America and, and, and Weimar Germany and then Nazi Germany and to other countries as well, but we never actually have the policy ourselves, um, which is you know a weird sort of ironic twist of this, this story. Mm -hmm. So, how much would you say uh, geneticists themselves might have contributed to spreading uh, 
this ideology because particularly in the 1930s 40s i think with the development of population genetics and the modern evolutionary synthesis i know there there was debate between different people like for example ronald fisher and jbs aldain but uh, do you think that geneticists, or some of them at least, also contributed uh, a lot to this ideology or not? Yeah, hugely. So, so just a little context here. That a lot of my work is basically around trying to understand how new research in science becomes co-opted into pre-existing political ideologies. Mm -hmm. And the two branches of my, the two main branches of my work in this regard are the, the origin of scientific racism, which occurs in the sort of 17th and 18th century. Yeah. Um, and in that, that part of my work, I, I, I suggest that the, the roots of biology, the roots of acad the academic discipline of biology emerge not in parallel with European expansion and colonialization, but in service of, mm. and, and similarly, the fields that we now refer to as genetics, psychology, statistics, and maybe some, some other periphery related um, academic fields, I argue that they also emerge not in parallel with the political ideology of eugenics, but in service of them. Now, the, the reason for this is because uh, after Galton comes up with this term and develops the idea in the late 19th century, in the first decade of the 20th century, his, his disciples are people like Carl Pearson and then subsequently Ronald Fisher. And so I know you know who those guys are, but between Pearson and Fisher, there are, there are almost no statistical techniques that we currently use which form the framework of how we understand the world through statistics that didn't come from those two guys. There, there, are, there are a few, but they are intellectual giants. Um, both of them, um, I mean, in, in trivial ways with things like the development of techniques like analysis of variance, the concept of variance, the concept of, of standard deviation as applied to populations, that actually comes from Galton more than anyone else, um, tool, tools like principal component analysis, that's, from, that's invented by Pearson, Pearson rank correlation coefficient, blah, 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 blah. These guys invented the fields of, of statistics that the entire world rests on. So they are colossuses. Um, and as you mentioned, the modern synthesis, the, the really big moment in biology that, that happens in the early 20th century is the fusion of genetics that was, was, was given a huge boost by the, the rediscovery of Mendel's work in 1900, or translation into English, really, of Mendel's work in 1900, fusing that with Darwinian natural selection, which was first yeah, um, touted in 1858, 1859. The modern synthesis is recognizing that the units of inheritance are genes and that uh, evolution by natural selection or artificial selection occurs in populations. And all of that was worked out by people like Pearson, Fisher, Sewell Wright. You mentioned JBS Haldane. Mm -hmm. Now the question then becomes, well, oh yeah, so I forgot to mention, Pearson and Fisher were also profound racists and profound supporters of, of eugenics. And I, you know, we have to be sort of historically contextual here. We always, I expect some of the viewers will be thinking, well, yeah, everyone was more racist back then, which is definitely true. Um, but they were racist for their age. So Pearson was profoundly anti-Semitic, viewed the Jews as a parasitic race. He used that, he used that phrase um, and was, profoundly concerned in an era where scientific racism was pretty normalized, but he was profoundly concerned that, for example, during the Boer War, uh, the British people were had their asses handed to them by what he described as an inferior uh, people. So this is the sort of social context for the emergence of the work that they were doing. Now, the, the, the key question, which is I'm very slowly getting to, <laughs> is, um, is their work and scientific legacy in inventing statistics in the fields of evolutionary genetics and so on, is that independent of their political views about race and mm -hmm. eugenics? Right. And can we separate them or not? 
I mean, I think the answers are interesting. Galton, no, his, he, he was fundamentally interested in white supremacy and his view of eugenics was that it was for in, in service of empire. Same for people like political people like Churchill. Um, Pearson, he is explicit. So just a, a tiny bit of history. Galton set up with a, with a financial legacy the Eugenics Research Laboratory called the Eugenics Records Office at University College London in the department where I am now. Um, and part of his legacy when he died was the foundation of the Galton Professor of Eugenics role. The, that, that was the first Galton Professor was Carl Pearson and the second was Ronald Fisher. When Pearson handed over to Ronald Fisher in, I think, 1930, uh, or maybe 32, I'll check that, um, he says very explicitly that my work in population genetics is in service of my, my, my politics. Fisher is less clear on this. Um, he, he wrote the foundational text for population genetics, which is called The Genetical Theory of Natural Selection. And when you're an undergraduate doing evolutionary biology, it's the text that you pretend that you've read because it's really hard and it's full of maths. And when I was 20, I couldn't get my head around it at all. But that's, it's like the origin of species. You know, this is the foundational text for this, for this field. Um, and the thing that we never talk about or, or but, you know, only occasionally recognize is that of the 12 chapters, only the first seven are about population genetics and the subsequent five are about eugenics. Um, now we, we don't really, yeah. So th there's some work done by a colleague of mine called Alex Aylwood, who's, who's found early drafts of, of Fisher's book. And in the early drafts, the eugenics chapters are at the front. And he thinks and argues, and I support this, that that also indicates that Fisher's, the development of the scientific ideas of population genetics were, I think, arguably in service of his political views about eugenics. Mm -hmm. But these are all, you know, these are all things to be debated. These are all things mm -hmm. that are part of the public discourse on, on, on this whole so subject. Mm -hmm. um, I know that was a very long answer. I'm talking very specifically about the UK here. In America, it was a very different story, and it was the whole eugenics project was entirely led by the by geneticists and, and, and one one man in particular, Charles Davenport. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, I want to ask you an, uh, about another. I think we can call it subfield of genetics, but just to establish sort of a bridge between what we're talking about now and what we're going to talk about later. Um, and because this is a very big topic in your work. So the concept of race, the, uh, from the perspective of genetics, and I've already talked with anthropologists, other geneticists on the show about it, but does it make sense whatsoever to, talk, uh, to have this concept of race? I mean, Possibly talking about ancestry, in certain cases, populations, because of course there are certain anatomical features that are distinctive between populations that have evolved in different environments, of course. But uh, uh, like categorizing people into different races, does that mm. make any sense? Well, I, I mean, you're asking me to explain in, uh, in, in a few hundred words the history of, of, of Western <laughs> Europe. So humans have got a very natural tendency to um, categorize things or to try to categorize things. And, and again, this relates to the, my first mm -hmm. answer to your question about definitions. Yep. It, it, is, it, it appears to be a, quite a human trait to say, to try and put things in boxes and say, this is a thing and it's different from this thing over here. Mm -hmm. Race, as we use it today, um, was basically invented in the 18th century. Those categorizations were invented by primarily by people like Carl Linnaeus, sort of the founder of biology, mm -hmm. in which he describes Homo sapiens, that's our genus and species, and four subspecies of humans, which are Americanus, um, so that's indigenous Americans, Atha, which is African, broadly sub-Saharan African, Asiaticus, which is people from where we call East Asia today, and Europeanus, so Europeans. 
And the, the, the categorization that he uses, or the, 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 how the taxonomy works, is initially by the first char characteristic is skin color, pigmentation. Mm -hmm. The second is hair color and texture. And for those four categories, it goes red, so red skin for Americanus, yellow skin for Asiaticus, uh, black skin for Africanus or Afa, and white skin for uh, Europeans. And then the second category, similar descriptions of those, those sort of broad hair categories and colors and textures, right? All right, so first thing is, they're kind of nutty, right? I mean, indigenous Americans don't have red skin. Uh, East Asians don't have yellow skin. We now know that there's more pigmentation variation within Africa than there is in the rest of the world, right? So these very clumsy phenotypic dis dis descriptions are clearly wrong, um, but they're very sticky and they're still, you know, terms that we use today. We talk about black people who like, I mean, in a very simplistic sense, don't have black skin. But we also categorize people from recent African descent as all, all of them as being black people, when in fact the pigmentation tones, if you ever go to Africa or know any um, uh, people from the African diaspora, their skin tones are incredibly variable. But the key thing that comes after those physical descriptions of so skin color and pigmentation is these unequivocally racist value judgments, which say things like black people are sexually capricious and governed by, well, by caprice. East Asians are greedy and haughty and governed by, um, I think, uh, tradition. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Native Americans are governed by customs and are stubborn. But whereas white Europeans are inventive and acute and bright and beautiful. So the racial taxonomies that are invented at the birth of biology by the founder of biology, using the taxonomic system that we still use today, were physical descriptions which are quite clearly inaccurate, followed by unequivocally racist value judgments. And in every single case, starting with Linnaeus until the 20th century, attempts to classify humans in this taxonomic structure are not simply classifications, they are hierarchical classifications. So again, this, this is a reflection of power structures in service of political ideologies. If you dehumanize or other people by saying that they're of inferior quality to another group of people, i.e. Europeans, it makes it easier to subjugate them. And that's an uncontroversial thing to say in history. It's a, it's a thing that many scientists are sort of vaguely unaware of. And I get quite a lot of pushback against that because Linnaeus is revered as, as, as the father of biology. And I, I'm neutral about it. I think his classification system is a pain in the ass more than anything else. Um, um, but then, you know, taxonomists will, uh, will, will bomb me in the, in the, in the, in the comments now. Um, but, but genetics has undermined that. So when we discovered the true metric of human variation, which is at a genetic level. So what are, how similar and different our DNA is in individuals and in populations. What we found is that the classification systems that had been used since Linnaeus did not correlate very usefully with genetic variation that we see around the world. And that's why we talk about race as being a socially constructed thing. So it's it has little biological um, utility, um, but we have adopted c vaguely consensus views about what races are, and they are defined by a complex mix of um, historical, economic, um, political, um, and geographical uh, uh, frameworks. So the simple answer to your question is, does it make sense to categorize people by race? Well, from a biological point of view, no, mm -hmm. not at all. It's not, a, it's not a useful way of understanding differences and similarities between people. In a social and cultural and historical way, it is something that we do, and therefore it is important. Race as a social construct is how people identify. Um, but it doesn't mean it's, it's a sort of hardwired, immutable thing, which is what the, the race scientists of, the, of, of history believed. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I would like to ask you now about behavior 
genetics because th that's a field that historically and perhaps presently i'm not sure has been also associated to some extent with eugenics and for me i mean i find it a bit weird because i talk with people like robert plomin for example and they tell me that we can't really use behavior genetics to study differences between groups or between populations. I mean, uh, they t uh, Robert Plomin and others tell me that we can do with behavior genetics is uh, understanding how uh, basically vary variation across individuals in a population, within a population. That's what they tell me we can understand through behavior genetics and not really race differences, sex differences, whatever. But, but at the same time, there are still people out there, weirdly enough, at least in my perspective, using behavior genetics data to push for narratives uh, surrounding race differences in IQ, for example, and stuff like that. So uh, what do you make of that? Right. Well, I mean, again, complex question, um, and I'll try to keep my. Um, you'll, you will have noticed that my answers don't tend to be very short, so I'm sorry about that. Um, so uh, let's just deal with the contemporary, because the history is, is is different and it's interesting. But um, I'm not a blank slatist, right? And that's one of the accusations that that people interested in race science today often make of. Or, or of people who um, talk about genetics and race and population similarities and differences, yeah. blank slateism is a is a busted flush in terms of in terms of its description of humans. We are not born without the influence of our biology, which is encoded in in our in our DNA. Yeah. Um, everyone is different. Um, everyone is born shackled to those genes. Um, how they express how those different versions of genes expressed during a lifetime is a complex interaction uh, between the environment and our, and our DNA. And when we talk about the environment, we don't mean necessarily uh, sort of like, for, I think people often think about the environment as being, you know, the, the green stuff or the, 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 the houses that we live in, how, whether our parents read books to us. The environment is literally everything in the universe which isn't genetic. So it does include whether your parents read books to us, but it also includes stuff like the orientation of you as an embryo inside your mother's womb. And those are things that we have to try and understand in, in not just behavior genetics, but in all genetics, how much of a characteristic is, is influenced by, by, by basic biology, by, by genetics, and how much of it is influenced by everything else in the universe, i.e. the environment. It's the, it is the conflict no, it's not the conflict because it's not a conflict. It is the relationship between nature and nurture, right? That's how it's characterized. And by the way, the person who came up with the phrase nature versus nurture was Francis Galton because he was trying to understand which what is inherent nature and what is acquired nurture. And he, he, called, he said it was nature versus nurture because he thought that they were in conflict. They're not in conflict. They work in concert. Uh, with each other. So nature via nurture is a phrase that I, I like to use more. Um, now, to, so that's a you know, boring history there, but um, we do see genetic differences between individuals and we see genetic differences in populations. Populations itself is a term which is a sort of only semi-useful in describing individuals that occupy groups so and, and we're actually moving away the, my next job after i finish talking to you is to write the advert for a new phd with me um which the title of which is removing the population from population genetics because i think it's it's not it's again it's a, it's a definitional term that historically was was basically a um a sort of mathematical convenience more than anything else and populations don't aren't really well defined but in our models we have to define them in order that the maths works anyway it's a side issue um, um people with shared ancestry are more likely to have similar dna to people they have less shared ancestry with this is a, a basic tenet of, of 
of biology. So what you do see is that there are different behaviors and different phenotypic characteristics, including physical ones like pigmentation and blah, 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 that occupy, that, that reflect ancestral um, inheritance from groups that we're mm -hmm. broadly calling populations, right? Now, so that's, that's, that's the opposite of blank slatism. People are different, populations are different, they reflect ancestry more than anything else. They don't reflect race because race is socially constructed, but they do reflect ancestral differences. Um, when it comes to things like intelligence, which is always the most fetishized, the, 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 the pinnacle of the thing that eugenicists historically and today are, are interested in, we're in very, very murky territory as to what that actually means. Um, and metrics like in the intelligence quotient, which I am not, a, I'm not an, an IQ denialist, I think it's an important metric. It measures something which relates very well to cognitive performance on various tests and various life outcomes. It has an enormously pernicious history, which we also understand well. We also understand that the tests are, are culturally specific and good psychologists using them recognize that there is cultural specificity and you account for that confounding factor. But the people I think you're alluding to who tend to be outside of the academy, who tend to be either not proper academics, but are fringe researchers who claim to be interested in heterodox subjects like race and intelligence, tend to do a very casual conflation of the significance of IQ with genetic differences seen in populations through ancestral differences. And they say, well, look, if you look at IQ tests in different countries, you look at IQ results, average IQs in different countries, you see that there is regional differences. And you see that, for example, that um, in many African countries, the average IQ is one or two standard deviations lower than it is for most European countries. And you think, well, you know, that is a very significant result. And then you do the next thing, which is to actually look at the data itself. Now, there's, there's a couple of data sets, IQ data sets, which purport to be representations of, of national IQs for different countries around the world, one of, one of which is, uh, has, has this you know, one or two standard deviations lower for most African or for many African countries. And that, that data set gets cited in hundreds of papers over the last few years and continues to be cited in the published literature. But when you look at the data itself, which in many cases was uh, uh, acquired or generated by a particular uh, group of people, including a researcher called Richard Lynn, who is a famous um, uh, race science obsessed uh, person, what you actually see is that the data is absolutely appalling and un unsupportable. So for example, um, uh, so some, some of the average IQs in some African countries in this data set are taken from tiny sample sizes or you know, less than 100 10-year-olds in a refugee camp from a different country and they didn't speak English as a first language and then the, 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 the results of these types of tests come out as, I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but like 60 or 70 or something like that. Yeah. And that becomes the national IQ for, for that country. Or um, uh, rural farmers with, with um, I think one example is from is an, an IQ in the, an, a national IQ in the 40s, which is sort of, it's a sort of incredible that anyone would think that that was robust data because people with an IQ in their 40s are not capable of independent living. And yet these, these data sets are saying, this is a country with an average IQ in, in, in their 40s. So it's obviously absurd. And then when you look at the provenance of the data, it's not only truly absurd, but it's also fraudulent. And so much of the discourse about national IQs and biological differences, genetic differences that result in different cognitive behavioral outcomes for groups of people is so lacking in scientific robustness that it's just laughable. Um, and one of the jobs that people like me need to do is expose that because you do still see papers citing this without just checking the provenance of the data. And I've seen people see, you know, publish a paper, see that the data is absolute bullshit and then actually withdraw the the, the, 
the, the papers as, as a result. So it's always good to just check the provenance of your data because data is never neutral. And in this case, national IQs, it's almost certainly fraudulent. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the interest of time, I have two or three more questions, if that's sure. okay. So um, in, in this previous question, in your previous answer, we've already touched a little bit on academia in the present day when it comes to ideas surrounding eugenics and these genics as well. So um, what about politically? Is eugenics still a thing? Uh, contemporarily in the political sphere? I mean, are there any countries out there where we can still find uh, eugenics measures, for example? Well, okay, let's park the semantic discussion about what eugenics is and how to define it, because we've already talked about that. But I think the yeah. answer to your question is clearly yes. Mm -hmm. So the eugenics mindset of trying to control populations is, is definitely present in many countries. In fact, I argue that it's it's prominent in the two most populous countries on earth, being India and, and China. Mm -hmm. And we can see specific examples of that in, um, for example, a sterilization program uh, called the Iron Fist Campaign in China in 2012, I think it was, uh, where something like 10,000 women who had violated the one-child policy by having a second child were sterilized against their will um, over the course of three months, right? That, it's hard to look at that and, and not think that that is eugenics in action. Mm -hmm. um, in India, which has you know enormous population growth and a population uh, uh, explosion that's been ongoing for several years now, which is, you know, is, is not, not unproblematic for a country to deal with, um, there was mass sterilization initially of men that recognizing that, that there was more resistance from men, it transferred to women um, during the period known as the emergency in 1979 under Indira Gandhi's uh, presidency. And um, that looks a lot like eugenics as well. The state coercing uh, or incentivizing people to become sterilized in order to have fewer children. Um, that is a eugenics type policy. Now that was in the 70s, uh, late 70s, early 80s. Um, in India today, the most common form of contraception is long-term sterilization for women of a childbearing age. So again, that is a mindset and a policy which is encouraged and incentivized, which looks a lot like the eugenics of, of, of the past. There is, so, um, we haven't really talked about America much, but America had enforced sterilization rules under eugenic auspices in 31 states for the majority of the 21st, uh, the 20th century, um, the last of which were only really repealed in the 70s or, <coughs> or 80s. And most of the people, the estimates vary, but between 60 and 400,000 people were sterilized against their will or knowledge. Most of those were descendants of the enslaved or indigenous Americans. Um, now those, those policies have all gone. The most recent case of enforced sterilization in America happened last year in ICE detention centers, or two years ago in fact, because it's now 2023. Um, and the numbers are significantly smaller, admittedly, but there is that, that, that mindset is, is still there. They always tend to be um, people at the bottom end of the socioeconomic um, ladder. Same in Canada, there's ongoing lawsuits with First Nations women who are suing the government for forced sterilization in the last 10 or 15 years. So those types of policies definitely still exist. There's another aspect to the continuing lingering presence of eugenics, which is, is more difficult to, to, to ascertain. But um, there's two aspects to this, and I'll say talk about them briefly. One of the one of the sort of big drivers of eugenics in America, at least in the early 20th century, was the foundation of an idea called Great Replacement Theory, which mm -hmm. is that the, the threat that middle class, um, middle and upper class, powerful people were being replaced, either by loose immigration policies or deliberately being replaced in, in, a, in a mechanism engineered by. A, a global Jewish cabal. Um, uh, which, by the way, sorry to interrupt, but great replacement theory is something you still hear about nowadays across different extreme right-wing groups. They're still making uh, that case. 
Yeah, absolutely. They're still making that case. And in fact, it predates it being founded in America in the 20s. It's also something that people talk about in analysis of the fall of Rome. And in all cases of great replacement theory, it, it, there's no evidence that it's ever happened or that it even would, would work. But the basic idea is that us, the middle classes, are not having enough children because we've been decadent and lazy, whereas the immigrants or the threat from within, from the lower or undesirable classes, uh, having too many babies, and um, and they are threatening our existence. Trump alludes to it, the far right alludes to it, it's becoming very normalized. And then an interesting thing happened last year, which is that people like Elon Musk started alluding to mm. ideas of great replacement theory by saying, he, he, he said, he tweeted once, I know he tweets a lot of bullshit and knows almost nothing, but he, he tweeted that the greatest threat to human, human civilization or something is not climate change, but it's um, it's population replacement. It's popul it's that that, oh that we're gosh. not we're not having enough children, and and he's there is a there is a movement in Silicon Valley, uh, a quiet movement for these types of tech bros to have as many children as they can manage. Elon Musk has fathered ten children by three different women, and I think that is part of the the sort of sensibility that my God, there are too many people that the poor or the immigrants are having too many people too many children and we're not having enough so the best way to counter it is for us to have more people like like me now it you know that is that sounds a lot like eugenics mm -hmm. and that's 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 a thing that's happening in silicon valley and it's a sort of open discourse from one of the most more prominent possibly the richest man on earth as part of his mindset about how he wants to structure humanity. So again, you know, it goes right back to the beginning of our conversation. It's a mindset. Eugenics is a way of thinking about who gets to reproduce or who doesn't get to reproduce and what humanity should look like mm -hmm. um, as a result of imposing those biological limitations on, on basic freedoms such as reproduction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the book, at a certain point, you call it a scientific creed. Yeah, creed. It's, that's, that's right. It's a belief system. Um, and it's, it, it, it's a way of thinking. Like I was saying a minute ago about how my work is about how science becomes politicized or becomes mm -hmm. marshaled into politics. We see it over and over again. New science happens and people say, that is going to be the justification for what I already think. And eugenics is a classic example of that historically and today. If you think there is a threat from immigrants because you, you are anti-immigration, then that's a, you know, that is a, a political position that, that people take. Um, it's not one that I agree with, but, but people are, you know, there should be diversity in views and politics. It, but if that is a position you take, then it becomes very easy to say, and look, here's a bunch of science which says that my political view is justified not by the fact that i have these these i have an emotional or, or just purely politically biased view on things as everyone does but actually there's science to back it up and that's that, that's where you know social historians are people who talked about the first bit of that but people like me and, and you get involved at this point because you're going well does the science back that up yeah and and, and that's you know that takes us to the beginning of the conversation again. Mm -hmm. So uh, just one last topic then, and I think it's important to address this one because people have been talking a lot about it in recent years, about genetic engineering. So because there's lots of promises being made and also lots of frightening claims also being made. So from what we know about the complexity of human genetics, and with the technology we have available nowadays, do you think it's really possible to alter our genomics significantly? Yes, I do. Um, but significantly is the right word, but meaningfully or usefully is the question. Um, so we are at a stage where we can, where genetic engineering is relatively trivial to do. We are at a stage when we have a complete working sequence of the human genome and literally millions of individual genomes. So our understanding of genetics 
and how our DNA is is part of of the, the structure of being a human is at an unprecedentedly high level. Um, so you've got two things happening there. You've got a bunch of knowledge about what, how genetics works, and you've got techniques which allow us to alter those things. We also have reproductive medicines which allow us to do that, those, to combine those two things, such as since IVF was invented in 1979 with Louise Brown, we now have the ability to look at our genomes, but also select embryos for, for if you want to eliminate particular diseases, and we're getting to the stage where we can select for particular traits so diseases and traits being you know two two sort of slightly separated things mm -hmm. so you combine those two things understand genetics complex sequencing and, and behavior genetics and all the things we've been talking about um uh the the ability to alter those things using new gene editing techniques such as crispr mm -hmm. ivf technology which allows us to combine those two things and put them into a into a, a mother well, that happened, right? That happened in 2018 with a scientist called Pei Zhang Kui, who in China announced the birth of two baby girls, sisters from the same pregnancy, who he had attempted to engineer, um, to genetically engineer so that they were immune to HIV infection. Now, you state it like that and think, well, that's a good thing, isn't it? Right? To be immune from HIV infection is, is something that we would want. Mm -hmm. So it occurs at a very low rate, I think it's like 1%, if you're homozygous for um, a particular mutation called Delta 32 and a gene called CCR5, then you can't get HIV. So his idea, the father was HIV positive, um, his idea was, why don't we engineer CRISPR in the Delta 32 mutation into the, these embryos and re-implant them and the children will be born um, with lifelong um, immunity to HIV. Now, that again, again, like you say it like that, and you think, well, hold on a minute, that sounds quite good. And then, when you start to scrape, you know, just just think about it a little bit more deeply, you realise that it's so fraught with so many technical and ethical issues that it's an abs it's what I consider to be the worst violation of bioethics in, in my lifetime. Mm. The, the first thing is that this is an unmet medical need, right? This is not a, this is not attempting to, to address a, a disease that they, that they have. This is attempting a prophylaxis for a disease mm -hmm. that almost everyone on earth never gets, right? We know mm. how to not, not get HIV. Um, the second thing is it's, it, it's, it's not, a medical intervention it's an experiment right mm -hmm. and as a result of understanding the experimentation that the nazis did in the second world war we have all sorts of international protocols the helsinki protocol the nuremberg declarations which are bioethical frameworks that prevent human experimentation without with without very very strict caveats totally violated by that the the, the third thing is when he announced this and published this work, he didn't actually publish it in a paper, he announced it at a press conference and on a YouTube video. By his own admission, the genetic edits that he had attempted, the Delta 32 mutation, he was unsuccessful and introduced two new mutations, or two new, two new alleles into the CCR5 gene, neither of which we have are known to, to nature or to science itself. And, and that would be, you know, if you, anyone with a vague sense of, of um, scientific ethics would just go, well, I'm, that's the end of that. But he implanted them anyway. Now, he was correctly um, uh, lambasted by the press and, and ended up going to jail for three years. He is now out. And by the way, as we have it, conducting this interview, for reasons that are totally opaque to me, is about to embark on a small university lecture tour talking about bioethics hosted by Oxford University and hosted by Kent University and I cannot for the life of me work out why you would think that's a good idea he is literally the least qualified person on earth to talk about bioethics anyway it's a side point the real point is that I think it's fair to say that having been a geneticist for the last 20 odd years I know quite a bit about the human genome I don't know nearly as much as my colleagues who work in 
in more specific areas of human genetics that relate to specific diseases. But I've got a pretty good overview, and I've written a lot of books about this. Right? That makes me a relative expert. Um, I Let me tell you this. We don't know how the genetics of eye color works, and yet that's the first thing we teach people at school about how genetics and inheritance works. We don't really know that. Um, if you if you do have you done a twenty three and me? Uh, no, not yet. Okay, well, tw eye color is one of the ca one of the things you get results for for from twenty three and me, and it, it looks at, for me it looks it looks at one of the genes involved in pigmentation in eyes, the one that is associated with blue or brown eyes, you know, a gene which for which which if you have one version you have brown eyes, and if you have two versions of another version two copies of the other version you have blue eyes, right? That's how we teach Mendelian genetics. Yeah. When you do the 23andMe, when I did the 23andMe, it comes out, it recognizes my the sequences, the bit of that gene and says, you've got a 69% chance of having brown eyes, right? You know, mm -hmm. how's that working out for you? Yeah. So I kind of <laughs> knew that anyway, without looking at the genes. Um, but the point, actually, that's, I think that's a good, so there's a good bit of science in there, which is it actually points out the probabilistic nature of genetics more than anything else. It says that it, having this version of the gene means that two out of three times you have brown eyes, but one mm -hmm. out of three you have blue or something else, right? right. And, and that model, the eye color, is the most basic way that we teach genetics. So, and by the way, little aside, that whole model was invented by Charles Davenport, the father of eugenics in America. He, he wrote it up in a paper in, in 1907, and even recognizing the complexities of eye color, because people don't have either blue or brown eyes, and something like 15 genes, or, or maybe dozens of genes are involved in pigmentation. Um, there's a bit in that, in that paper which I think is hilarious. He's, he categorized people as being blue-eyed or brown-eyed, and then he says, that some of these people have hazel eyes, um, but we consider them to be blue. I mean, sure, if you just want to state that something which is obviously not true is true to fit your model, you're not really doing good science there. Anyway, the point is that if you've got people like me saying, I wouldn't genetically engineer a baby for eye color because we don't know enough about eye color genetics. Yeah. If you're talking about engineering genes for disease resistance or for behavioral traits or for intelligence mm. we are so far from having even the most basic understanding of the relationship between genetics and, and those traits that i wouldn't go near it and that's not even accounting for the fact that the techniques that we currently have are very powerful but but not perfect mm. um so I think most of the public discourse on genetic engineering and sort of so-called designer babies is more heavily influenced by pop culture and politics than an actual understanding of human biology. Mm -hmm. But we should still be at least a little bit worried about it. Or... It's happening. And mm -hmm. the birth of Lulu and Nana, we don't know anything about them. They're, they, Hei Jen Kuei claims they're living a normal life. We hope they are. There was a third baby born whose, whose name was Amy. We know less about her. The fact that it's happened once and has been publicized once makes me suspicious that that is not the only time that it's happened. And incidentally, I think this is going to be a cul-de-sac in, in the big story um, eventually, because this is a technology which is only available to people who are going through IVF and only available to wealthy countries. I don't think it's going to have a hugely significant impact on um, on, on society, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be looking at it, and it certainly doesn't mean that we certainly shouldn't be doing it. Most people still prefer to have babies the old-fashioned way, mm -hmm. which is cheaper and more fun. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, the book is again Control, the Dark History and Troubling Present of Eugenics. I'm leaving a link to it in the description box of the interview. And Dr. Rutherford, just before we go, would you like to tell people where they, where they can find you and your work on the internet? Sure, I'm, I'm very easy to find. I only exist in social media on Twitter where I spend half my time posting pictures of my dog. <laughs> <laughs> who's currently on, on, sitting on my foot, 
down there I won't show you um, and half the time railing against terrible pseudoscience so I apologize I'm slightly addicted to Twitter and I wish I could quit it but you know them's the breaks um, but yeah e easy to find if you just google me that's me Okay, great. So thank you so much again for taking the time to come on the show. And it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. And for me too. And I can only apologize for the length of my answers. <laughs> Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing and to keep the channel sustainable, please consider supporting it on Patreon or PayPal. The links are in the description box of this interview. And if you like this interview, Please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check the website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters. Karen Litzkan, Blanchett Perga, Larson, Jerry Muller, Hans Frederick Sunda, Bernard Seixas, Herbert Gintis, Olaf, Alex, Jonathan Visser, Adam Kessel, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Enric Alenia, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Simon Columbus, Phil Cavanagh, George Pinha, Michael Stormier, Samuel Andrea, Francis Ford, Tiago Nunes, Alexander Dan Bauer, Fergal Cusson, Harl Herzog, Nun Machado, Jonathan Leibrandt, John Nyers, Stanton, T. Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, João Eira, Tom Hummel, Sardis France, David Sloan Wilson, Yassil Adez, Araújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Yannick Puntara, Dan Arzmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pablo Stazewski, Nelek Bach, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, Simon Fzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paul Tolentino, João Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Doug, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzka, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wisman, Morton Eichland, Dr. Bird, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Mau Maria, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Lowacki, Georgios Steofanis, Chris Williamson, Peter Wolosin, David Williams, Ruth Towell, Diogo Costa, Anton Erickson, Charles Murray, Alex Shaw, Amari Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Pedro Bonilla, Ziegler, João Barbosa, Bangalore Atheists, Larry D. Lee Jr., Old Herrigman, Sterry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Gracies, Tom Roth, D. RPMD and Eager N. And special thanks to my producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafinia, Tom Vanagdam, Bernard Ugni, Curtis Dixon, Belnick Miller, Vega Giddy, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, John Carlo Montenegro, Robert Lewis and Alni Cortiz, and to my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.